Lily, are you singing today? Who's gonna sing today? The lady's gonna sing? Michelle, you're not singing with her? Duet? I had compliments about you two on the site. Compliment. Compliment means, you know, they like it. You say that I'm not able, I'm too young or I'm too old. Can't sing or teach and no title do I hold. Lord, what can I do? Lord, I want to do my part. And I want to help the hurting with all of my heart. I can pray until the walls come down. Till your spirit can be found. That's something I can do. I can pray in my secret place. Calling on your name. That's something I can do. I can pray. My family shows no interest. My friends have gone so far. I try my best to reach them. But their hearts just seem so hard. Lord, what can I do? To help and bring them to back to you While my friends are lost and dying And my words do not get through I can pray Till the walls come down Till your spirit can be found That's something I can do I can pray In my secret place Calling on your name That's something I can do I can pray in my secret place, calling on your name, that's something I can do. I can pray, we can pray, I know you hear us, Lord, when we pray, so will you pray. We are called to make a difference In a world that does not seem to care We are called to take the gospel To a dying people everywhere A generation searching for the truth We have the answer What are we gonna do? Impact your world Let them see the love of Christ like a beacon in the night, shining brightly in your life, impact your world like a hammer on a nail, with a voice that cannot fail, impact your world. We are called to be a witness and to stand for what we know we should. We are called to have compassion, leading others in a way that's good. He has chosen us to run this race and to cross the line no matter what it takes. Impact your world, let them see the love of Christ like a beacon in the night, shining brightly in your life. Impact your world like a hammer on a nail with a voice that cannot fail. Impact your world with a voice that cannot fail. Impact your world. Amen. Amen. It's always hard doing singing acapulco, acapella. Because your voice echoes back and there's nobody filling in things with notes. So, amen. Alrighty, you have your Bibles turned to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 this morning. Mark 
chapter 7. We'll be reading uh, verse 1 to 23, but our text is found in uh, verse 13. So chapter 7 of Mark, verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Heavenly Father, I pray that you give me clarity of thought, liberty of speech, and God, uh, just uh, help me to communicate. Pray, God, that it's effective, that uh, God will grow a little bit. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm entitling the message, Loopholes. I'm sure I used that title, Loopholes or something, or this along the line after all these years. But the loopholes. And uh, what I put down for loopholes is to avoid the full impact of a law violation. To avoid the full impact of a law violation. We know that lawyers or liars, or what you want to call them, diligently search for them. And uh, in some cases in my life, it really helped. But uh, loopholes is something to get a hold of here today with uh, all these verses we'll be reading. But first, I want to establish uh, the responsibility for our sin. Uh, we need to establish this because a lot of people somehow have a problem with that. Go to James chapter 1, James chapter 1, to see what God says about it. James chapter 1. The responsibility for our sin. Hmm. James 1. Uh, 13 to 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Now, God did not make you sin. He allowed it because you're a free agent. Your decisions control your life. Uh, we don't uh, fall into sin. We willfully do it. We allow our imagination to dwell where it should not. So in saying that, from the verses, we know that uh, we allow that thing to happen. There's no, you know, no excuse for it. Right? Right. Don't blame God. Don't blame your mother, your brother, your sister. Don't blame TV, phone, radio, anything. Decisions are made by free agents, and we're all free agents. So let's consider grace, too. And uh, go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. We'll consider grace as a teacher in holiness, that's for sure. Chapter 2, and uh, let's see, verses uh, 11 to 14. Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, look what it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That's what it says. That's what it says about grace. So, <laughs> sin can be executed or evaded according to our decision. Grace is never used as an excuse to sin or a green light to do it. Grace is holy like God. God teaches his children to be holy, and we don't want to ever forget that. Uh, people today are getting it confused, it seems. They're adding grace, you know, that, well, you know, anyway, that'll be part of my message, no doubt. Go to Mark 7. <laughs> and you... You just think about all this, the age of grace, this is grace. Everybody has certain conceptions or something of it. And I just know this, that there's a verse in the Bible in Hebrews, right? 
that says uh, tells us to come boldly, right? Come boldly before the throne of grace, right? But what are we attaining? What are we attaining? Mercy in the time of need, right? That's what the verse says. So yeah, the throne of grace, that's where God is, right? He is grace. And uh, you go there, but you need mercy. You need mercy. Mark 7. Mark 7 and verse 1. And uh, we'll go to 23 verses. Yes, we will. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with, def with defiled, that is to say with unwashing hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? He answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites? Somebody said, Oh, he's a nice Jesus. Yeah, he's nice when he's supposed to be nice, but he's mean when he's supposed to be mean. And right here, he's just like nipping it in the bud a little bit. Anyway, <laughs> he says, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied to you hypocrite, hypocrites as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God, Ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. And he said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curses father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is what? Corbin. Now, Corbin. The gift of Corbin occurred when the firstborn did not want to bear the financial burden for the care of his elderly parents. He would give the savings of his parents to the priest at the temple. The priest would bless the gift, and the firstborn would say that he had no money to bear the financial burden of his aged parents. When his parents died, the firstborn would get the inheritance from the priest for a fee of holding the gift. How about that? Now you know what Corbin is. Mm. Verse 12. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. You know what the first commandment would promise is, right? Honor thy father and thy mother. Mm. Verse 13. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man? It cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out in a drought, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, <laughs> that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. 
All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So all that story that we see with the traditions and all this stuff, looking at it and understanding what he said, I would say, I conclude, obeying our heart instead of God's word drives us to look for loopholes. That's what I say. Now, we traditions here, and he says such like, different things. Loopholes they use to avoid the law. Loopholes. And uh, here in our story, once again, tradition is used. When tradition doesn't violate the word, it's okay. There's a lot of things to do out of tradition. Different local churches do different things. They're indigenous, self-governed. But if whatever they're doing violates the word of God, you need to stop it. You need to stop it. Now, God said the heart is desperately wicked. Who said that? God said that. God said the flesh, if not put to death, can lead to a multitude of sins. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Talking about loopholes when we use the story to illustrate that man will come up with all sorts of things to bypass what God wants him to do. They really will. And it's all, it all revolves around the heart of the individual. The heart of the individual. And over here in, in Galatians chapter 5 and uh, verses uh, 17 and 18, the Bible says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, ye are not under the what? Law. Whenever you sin, whenever you do something wrong in this flesh, guess why? You know the reason you feel bad, right? You broke the law. Are you, are you under the law? No. But your flesh went ahead and them commandments are there for a reason, right? The commandments are what convinces a sinner that he can't keep them. That's why he needs Jesus to save him, right? Because he kept all things. He fulfilled the law. But us during our life, we're trapped in flesh. And a lot of times, people will negotiate. They think they're negotiating with God. And they somehow get a loophole going. Some people have a tradition of drinking real wine real alcohol beverages at the Lord's Supper because they haven't did their study and really studied that out about them barrels and the Lord making wine. He said new wine. There's wine of the cluster, new wine. New wine means it's not fermented. And could you imagine God Almighty creating something that already is spoiled bacteria-wise, <laughs> not natural? I don't think he can do that, but he could do it if he wanted to, but I don't think he did that. But people will use that with no regard to an alcoholic coming to their church that's been off the booze for I don't know how long, and they go ahead and they do that stuff. It's their tradition. They're not hurting anybody. And then some of them even do that and preach against social drinking. I'm telling you, there's some messed up stuff out there. It really is. But traditions that go along don't violate, fine. But when you use traditions and other things to violate God's word, Bad. Why? Because we know that the flesh and the spirit are at war all the time. you <laughs> you got to be aware of that. Now, it's interesting that in chapter 5 also, he, uh, we start in verse 19 and 21, we see that the, God gives you the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. In verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Remember the last verse, the verses over in the Gospels we read, he listed some things. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, rivalings, and look what it says, and such like. 
of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. And I look at that and I'm saying, man, the works of the flesh. <clears throat> so why do you need a loophole? Why would you even need a loophole? Well, because you like sinning and want to continue. That's the only thing I can think of. I, I told you all before and I'll repeat it again. After about 50 years old, I stopped arguing with people. Somebody's come up to me trying to look at all the qualifications and everything of, of a bishop or whatever, and they concentrate on the verses talking about wine for your stomach's sake, a little wine, you know. Why are you emphasizing that and not taking care of your mother and your family, you infidel, you know. Usually they've got all this other stuff going against them, and they pick this one thing. So I just come to the conclusion, they just want to drink. They want me to excuse their drinking, that's all, so I'm not going to do it. So I said, go ahead and get drunk then. Oh, that ain't what I mean. I said, well, I, argue. I mean, you know, if you can't read the Bible, ask God, get peace. You know, if you think moderation is okay, you can do moderation, fine. Somebody watching you looks at you approve of it, and they do it, and they don't do it, and they go out and get in the car wreck, well, that's their problem. Well, testimony is pretty heavy duty in the Bible. And then the same thing with hemp is found in the Bible. You know that. And uh, so marijuana ought to be okay because God created it, and it grows. I told a guy, well, why don't you come out here and when poison ivy comes out, you can roll a joint on that and smoke that. Well, no. I said, oh, you got a decision to make, don't you? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, God's not in that, so just simplify it. And when you go through all these lists, somebody says, well, <laughs> mine's not on it. Well, it says such like, such as. You see that? I mean, just put yours in there, too. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying... The flesh always looks for loopholes. Think about why do you need a loophole? Because you like sinning and want to continue. Number two, why do you make excuses by saying, well, well we all still sin. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Why not admit to God you're weak and need him? And do what he said. Confess it. Read the book every day. Pray every day. Confess up every day. That seems to be simple enough. Rules, he made it simple for everybody so they can get it. You can't live the Christian life without Christ. And if you're not led by the Spirit, you'll fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's guaranteed. Why? Because the opposite, the antithesis, whatever you call it. Anyway, we just read that. If, if you're led by the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you're not being led by the Spirit. Remember the Bible definition of sin? We're drawn away by our own lusts. We said that, uh, we, we uh, read that in James. And don't be copping out on grace. Well, you know, I'm saved. I'm just sinner saved by grace. God knows it and unconditionally loves me. And I can just do anything I want because his grace is so good. You have not read your Bible. First time grace shows up is with Moses. I mean, I'm sorry, Noah. Thank you. Whew, that'd have been all over. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. First time mentioned. But what did he do? He moved with fear. Well, that's reverential fear. I don't think so. I think God said, Bud, this is what we're going to do. Yes, sir. Why? Because God, God's going to bring a flood here and destroy everybody. And these people lived long enough already from Adam that they understand what God can and cannot do. Moved with fear. So in our story, it was Jesus dealing with religion. And God knows what true religion is, and God knows what it isn't. I mean, covering up sin is like Adam hiding on God. Every time I read that, God's saying, Adam, where you at? Duh. <laughs> That, to, that, that probably, I'm telling you, that had to scare Adam to death. And Eve. You know, where are you? You ain't hiding from God. He's everywhere. Man. Think about that. He's everywhere. I mean, it just don't work to hide from God is what I'm saying, Christian. The heart, our heart eventually manifests itself. And others will know. Yeah. After all, the Bible says it's from the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaketh. 
conversational change. Words will start coming out that I never used in a long time. Other stuff starts happening. You start to realize, man, I've been asleep here. The devil's done put me to sleep. And I need to wake up. I need to wake up. I know advice to us when our mind begins to imagine a sin, change our thoughts. You've got to change your thoughts. When we start to excuse our weaknesses, stop and admit. Admit him. That weakness before our God. And seek his strength. Don't move till you get enough strength. He said that he'd always provide a way. Remember that? Provide a way of escape. There, there's a knoll or a type of a hill. I'm trying to think. I'm thinking it's Tennessee or something. Anyway, it uh, just looks like a knoll. And you, walk, you can walk up, right, to this. It's, it's on the top of a mountain-like type of mountain range. Might be smokies. I don't know. But it tells us one kid that is walking up there. Everybody knows, you know, you shouldn't walk too far up there. It's dangerous. Well, he walked up to the knoll, and since it was round like that, once he took one step, he screamed, but nobody could help him. Momentum took him. So there is that, that way with sin. Once you get to that certain level, the slippery slope, you don't know what's going to happen, and boom, boom. You know what I mean? It's just like you're taken over by that, that deal. And uh, live longer, you experience more of this stuff. And, and the fall in sin, I heard that over the years. Thank God I had some, some really iron lung preachers. You know, on that falling in sin stuff, because everybody and their mother was using that as a loophole. Well, I was minding my own business. I just fell into sin. <laughs> Every preacher I heard back in the 70s, man, he didn't fall into sin. You premeditated it, dummy. You ain't convincing me you fell into no sin. If you're saved, the Holy Ghost in there saying, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden, you don't hear him no more because you're on your way. You didn't fall into sin. And I read the Go read the verses over and over again in James. God didn't tempt you with evil. It says over here, God uh, put, tempted me. Well, you know, there's context. One is he's testing you, right? And then the context of this was talking about sin. Now, if you're his child, everything's got to go through him. So a lot of times he'll allow a whole lot of stuff for us to get repentive and for us to get quiet and sometimes just get back to where we were to understand that he's holy wants you to be holy and the way you can be holy is through the spirit God giving you victory over things God empowering you to go on for him and we do it by faith what does that mean you don't stop wait and ponder if you know what the scripture already says you just do it if it says uh, confess your sins 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's just and faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all sins, something like that. 1, 9. I mean, if there's verses in there already, then that's what you do. The Bible says if any man says he doesn't have sin, he's a liar. Truth's not in him. I'm talking to Christians over there. And that's why next thing you know, we got an advocate. Who's that? Not a liar, a real lawyer. <laughs> that's Jesus Christ. Our advocate. So, I mean, God paints us illustrations and pictures of our hope, our security, our relief valves. You know, it's in the book. And it's about faith in the book. That's why the book is always under attack. So, when the mind begins to imagine a sin, change thought. When we start to excuse our weaknesses, stop right there. Don't play that weakness stuff in a sense but uh, I'm sorry you better play the weakness stuff and tell God that you're no match for whatever's going on and that you need a strength you'll start to appreciate who's inside of you when we look for loopholes let, let the uh, as soon as you start looking for a loophole I'm telling you let sirens go off flashing lights to go off in your brain say whoa 
What's a loophole? Anything to excuse my actions somehow a little bit. You know, the spirit's strong with the flesh is weak, right? Remember that? That's why I did it, because the flesh is so weak. No, the spirit's weak. The flesh is strong. Everybody getting this? Amen. So God doesn't like his children thinking they can trick them, I'll tell you that. So we are in the day of Laodicea and perilous times. We are in a country thus far that has liberty. We are bombarded 24-7 with immorality, nakedness, perversion. Therefore, it requires more vigilance, more spiritual defenses, more prayer, more pleading the blood of Jesus Christ, more reading scripture. I'm telling you, our actions require more. More of what? Well, in the age we live, passing out tracts, conversations with people, using truth over error, more diligence in serving God in the local assembly. That would be a great thing. Loopholes. I mean, we've got to remember when we sin, openly or secretly influences weaker Christians. And not only that, younger ones. Not only that, the unsaved are affected to where they don't want nothing we got. I'll close with a quote from E.C. Beard. He says, uh, and to answer the question, what is the will of God? Well, here's the answer, true. The nearest thing that should be done that he can do through you. The nearest thing, right, that should be done that he can do through you. That could be yourself, your weaknesses, your temptations, but it also goes out to whatever the Holy Spirit tells you. I don't know about others, but I know about me. When I'm supposed to give somebody a track and I don't get, give it to them, I feel awfully bad. If you want feelings, that's a bad feeling. If I want to get right with God, I'll turn around and go back and give the person a track. <laughs> and the peace comes back. Back Culver's and yesterday and trying to give a track there. Anytime you pick up food or anything, just do what you can do and do, do it a lot more now. More people have to be covered now than ever before. There's more wickedness, more darkness. And uh, we do have the print and press. We do have tracks. So even if you're squeamish, everybody can pass out a track, hide a track, do something with tracks. Amen. Do our war with tracks. That would be the key. So loopholes. Beware of them. Beware of you using them. Uh, can't hide from God. No way, Jose. You're not going to impress God. You're just supposed to please God. Right? Please God. All right, let's pray.